Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Mark Jacobson, UMS Senior Programming Manager, filling in for Christina Hamilton today as she is traveling. Today we present Interaction Designer and STEM School Assistant Professor Seth Ellis. Today's presentation marks the final event of the fall season. The new winter season announcement is available in the lobby and the official calendar will be coming out soon. Please take an announcement on your way out and join us in the new year when we reconvene for the winter season on January 15. The Stamp School is hosting the first Stamps Design Charrette January 16 through 18. The charrette is focused on the Ebola virus disease and is arranged in interdisciplinary collaboration and participation from schools of medicine, public health, nursing, and LSNA. Over three days, students, faculty, and alumni will work in teams to generate creative responses to health communication across cultural and linguistic barriers, design of personal protection equipment, and transportation of infected and diseased bodies. Students interested in signing up to be part of this project can find more information on the school's website or by contacting Professor Jan Henrik Anderson. The sign-up deadline for this opportunity is December 24. Additionally, an Autodesk CAD workshop will be offered this Saturday from 1.30 to 3 p.m. in room 1504 GG Brown at the Engineering School to introduce students to 3D design and modeling. Free pizza and Autodesk takeaways will be offered. As a member of the UMS curating team, I want to be sure to mention a few upcoming winter season UMS events. The creative team behind storytelling juggernaut The Moth joins Edgar Oliver to present their theatrical piece, Helen and Edgar, at the Arthur Miller Theater in early January. On Saturday, January 31, UMS brings minimalist Brooklyn trio Dawn of Mini, featured on WNYC's Radio Lab, to Detroit's Trina Sof outside of Eastern Market. And in February, the steel guitar driven gospel family, the Campbell Brothers, celebrate the 50th anniversary of John Coltrane's seminal recording of A Love Supreme right here at the Michigan Theater. More information on these UMS events may be found in the lobby. We will have our regular Q&A today in the screening room directly following today's talk. Please come and meet Seth Ellis with your questions. As always, please be sure to turn off your cell phones and mute your electronic devices. And now, for a formal introduction of today's speaker, Stamp School Associate Professor and Executive Committee Member, Hannah Smotrich. Thank you. It's a pleasure to introduce my Stamps faculty colleague, Seth Ellis. Seth's background in anthropology, comparative literature, and film has led to his hybrid creative practice as an artist, designer, and writer. His work takes many forms. It has been exhibited and published nationally and internationally. He has been awarded numerous grants and residencies. Much of Seth's work centers on language and narrative. As a storyteller, Seth makes words tangible, concrete, and physical. He also makes words fleeting, ephemeral, and inaccessible. He orients us by revealing histories and disorients us by inventing imaginary histories. Seth decodes language. Seth encodes language. He keeps us on our toes. Seth's work is grounded in rigorous research while embracing wit, curiosity, and the literary imagination. He is a sensitive observer and an intriguing maker. Please join me in welcoming Seth Ellis. Gosh. Hi, everybody. Um, I think, you know, they tell you about your stamps talk before you do it, and mostly what they say is you can't see a thing, and it's true. I, I'm just, I'm talking to a wall of light, but 
Um, whatever you guys are doing, I'll be up here talking about some stuff. First off, I want to thank Hannah for that lovely introduction, which basically said everything that I'm about to say, so I feel like I could just stand here and nod for a while, but I won't. Um, thank you to Mark for introducing her, and thank you, of course, to all of you for being here. So mostly what I'm going to talk about is my own work, uh, but I'd like to start with a bit of introduction to a couple of um, ideas that sort of stay with me through my work and, and sort of explain a bit more about those. Uh, I am an artist and designer. I also write, as Hannah said. I started out as a writer, uh, writing screenplays. And while my work is um, distributed and exhibited as both art and design, what I think of myself as is a writer who designs. Um, I design the things that I write, and I sometimes design things in a way, design experiences in a way that forces me to write in a certain way. Uh, what I write about has circled mostly around ideas of place, very specific place and the ways that we inhabit them, about the past of those places, and especially recently about the objects that originate in those places and that serve as sort of divination objects, divination tools for us to learn about the past of those places. So I'd like to talk about, start out with a couple of things that um, have informed the way that I think about the past, a couple of interactions I've had with the past in a couple of um, different media. Um, you know, the interesting thing about giving this talk at this point is my IP students, that is the, for those of you, if anybody here doesn't know, um, the senior capstone students uh, doing their year-long project, they're about to give their presentations on their projects in about a week. And you know, we tell them, do this, don't do that, here's some stuff to keep in mind. And one thing we say is, um, Tell them a, bit, a little bit about yourself. Let them get to know you as a person up front. So this is my dad. Um, he is 10 years old here in Detroit. He lived in Detroit until he was 10, and th then the family moved away. I had seen this uh, photo when I was a kid, and it always had that sort of alien impact to me when you see your, your parents when they were kids. It's like looking into a little alien landscape. Um, the past, in that sense, just is completely unhooked from your experience of your parents. When I moved to Michigan and uh, was in the neighborhood of Detroit, it suddenly occurred to me that this wasn't just a picture of my dad, it was a picture of Detroit, uh, specifically of his house or the front yard of his house on Longfellow Street with him having some kind of imaginary adventure there. Um, and so the, le the next time I visited my folks, I uh, looked up this photo, I found the address, and I um, eventually went down and took a look at the house, um, my family's old house, or rather my dad's family's old house. Uh, this is on Longfellow Street in a neighborhood that's now called Boston Edison, which is a historical district. Uh, this is on sort of the ragged end of Boston Edison. Um, this house is now abandoned. This was in February of last year, and at that point, not only was the house abandoned, it was on the market for $26,000, which, if you know Detroit, is not unusual. Um, there's a lot of uh, issues going on there. Boston Edison, being a historical district, has missed out or is like fighting the good fight against some of those issues. But it's clear here that the neighborhood that my dad lived in is not the neighborhood it once it was. And there's, it's easy to say the old cliche, you can't go home again. But the thing that interested me most about this was, of course, you know, it's not my home anyway. It was my dad's home. Um, and so for me, it took me a long time to get around to going to Longfellow Street and taking a look at this house uh, because I knew what I would find, or rather I knew what I wouldn't find. And what I wouldn't find is, whoop, certainly not Dearborn, what I wouldn't find is this place here, this place where my dad spent his childhood. Because his childhood not only was 60 years ago, but it, in, it inhabited an imaginary space, the space of childhood as he lived through it, with you know, this tree being all that was protecting him from the Nazis or what have you. Um, there's, a, there's a past there, there's a landscape there that inhabited the real landscape, but that I can't get at. The only way that I could get at was, would be to go into the photo and spend time there. So that's something I think about. And I actually made work about this, which I'll get back to in a little bit. But first, I do want to come to Dearborn. Um, recently, in fact, this past fall, I did a project with a collaborator um, doing historical research and representing the past of Dearborn as the birthplace of modern industry in the sense that it's the um, home, the birthplace of Henry Ford, and also where he built what was then the largest factory in the world. Um, as part of our historical research, we of course did some field research looking for various locations in Dearborn, and we were looking for this Elks Lodge on Michigan Ave. Um, the Elks Lodge used to be a farmhouse owned by Henry Ford. It was at one point a, uh, a home for orphaned boys who uh, Henry Ford would put up there and teach useful skills, and then they'd sort of get suctioned right into the uh, factory system, become factory workers for Ford. Um, after that, it was taken over by Mrs. Ford and was a home for wayward girls, i.e. pregnant girls. Um, who would learn 
cleanliness and domestic skills and then be sent out in the world to be decent 20th, 20th century Americans was the theory. Um, after that, um, it became an Elks Lodge, and it was an Elks Lodge for a long time, and we thought it was still an Elks Lodge earlier this year when we went looking for it. It turned out, though, it had been demolished about a few months um, earlier, soon enough in the past that it's still in all the Google information. So we were frantically looking for this thing that Google kept telling us where it was, but we couldn't find it. Um, we finally managed to uh, locate this Tim Horton, which is what's there now, um, and there was a woman working in the Tim Horton who used to go to parties at the Elks Lodge, and she told us that it actually was right next door to the Elks Lodge, um, but had since been demolished. And while we were, but while I was um, doing the primary research, which of course I did in Google Street View, like a good 21st century citizen, um, I noticed something very weird about the presentation of this road as it appears in Google Street View, which claims to be an up-to-date representation of what's going on here. Here I am at the Tim Horton, you can see it, and I'm gonna try to play this video. I'm zooming along, zooming along Michigan Avenue, here we go. Suddenly I'm in the past. This is the wrong photo. This is 2013, this is 2007. And you can see my arrow there, trying to navigate around, there's no way past it. You can't get out, you're stuck in the past unless you back out this way. It's like this weird little cul-de-sac of the past that you get, you get stuck in, and you, you, you wonder what the heck's going on, because that building just isn't there anymore. And when this happened, I was sitting next to my collaborator, this is a collaboration with a friend of mine from North Carolina, and I turned to him and I said, this is it, this is the thing. And he said, what thing? And I said, this, this is the thing that we're doing, this, you know, getting into this little cul-de-sac of the past, and he was very nice about it, I was not super articulate at the time, but it is the thing. It's the thing of the past suddenly juxtaposing itself when you're least expecting it with the present. You get trapped in some little bubble of the past that you weren't expecting in this very generic uh, stretch of uh, Michigan Ave with a Tim Horton and all the, all the chains that have replaced the very particular history. But the particular history is still there somewhere, and it just sort of jumps up at, it, at you every once in a while. Of course, this is something to, to think about and to be aware of, because once you know that the past is there, you can recreate it, as we were trying to do. You can say, this is where the Elks Lodge was in the past. But you can also recreate alternative, alternate pasts. You can redesign the past in various ways to say, this is what was here. No, this is what was here. No, this is what I would rather say was here. And this actually happens for good purposes and bad all the time. And it's worth being aware of the media and the strategies that we use to do that. Um, so this is what I like to do. I like to think about the past and I like to think about our interaction with the past and the way that we tell the past as a story to ourselves. These are some things that we say about the past, about past events and about stories that happen there. They're real, they're true, they're accurate, and or they're convincing. I'm gonna come back to this a little later, but what I wanna think about right now when I go into thinking about my work is not actually any of these, these words, but this word, fidelity. Um, thinking about fidelity to the past, to the historical record, to what people said, to the objects that were there, to the places that were there. Um, there are a lot of ways that people do this. There are a lot of ways that I've done this in my practice. Forensics, um, and thank you to my grad student, Josh, for bringing this, comp this uh, issue up last week. Hi, Josh, if you're here. Um, forensics is a way that we do this. It's a way that we think about the past in a way that hopefully as, has as much fidelity as possible, is as loyal as possible to the physical truth about the past in order to tell a story about it in pu a public story that we can all agree on. Um, and the especially the recent history of how this works, is very um, heightened and conflicting, but this is um, at, the at, the, at the heart of how we understand the past. So going back to this guy, this is how I chose to um, think about my dad's life in Detroit. I do a lot of research for my projects. I uh, investigate the history of that territory, and a lot of that underwrites everything that I do without necessarily being a parent. What I did was I created a series of road signs, there are about uh, 10, pretending to be historical markers of things that happened in that place, but they're historical markers about the imaginary story that my dad was enacting on that day in that photo. So rather than, it's, it's all very carefully sourced to the actual territory, these signs were placed along Longfellow Street, um, but they're telling the story of the, the imaginative um, landscape that he lived in or that he was moving through rather than the real territory as I experience it today. Uh, he's dead eye Dick, his name is Dick. Um, and he has an interaction with Mr. Motor. These were all um, 
it's a very metaphorical story. It's, it's actually an allegory for the, the development of um, industry in, in Detroit and in Michigan. Um, but these were placed around to encourage people to think about things that might have happened here, to think, to think about this place as an imaginative landscape, not just as a um, physical landscape and not just as a, you can sort of see the detritus of um, this contemporary neighborhood in the background. Um, and it was also for me to figure out my relationship to this particular past, this very particular moment in the past. Um, thinking less imaginatively but, and uh, more comprehensively about Detroit, uh, a couple of years ago I was a part of a research grant with our own John Marshall and a couple of uh, architects from Talbot College, a research in the city grant to investigate um, the history of manufacturing and the story of manufacturing in Detroit. And this project is called Retoolkit for Detroit. What we were interested in was us as outsiders coming into this um, famous landscape and very dense landscape of people making things, making things for the auto industry, making things for each other, making products to sell, um, and thinking, how, how can we get in here? How can we start a conversation? How can, like, where's our entry to this landscape? Especially since when you are looking around for manufacturers in Detroit, they all kind of look like this. They're all sort of hidden from view. Um, in this case by vegetation, but even if the trees weren't there, they're all blank warehouses, blank tin sheds. There's really no sign of what's going on, the enormous activity um, and mechanical industry going on on the other side of that shrubbery. Um, there's, there's a couple reasons for this. First off, uh, nobody really wants to advertise the fact that they have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uh, machinery for people to steal, so they tend not to um, have windows, for instance. Uh, but also, you know, in Detroit in particular, these places were so, so deeply entrenched in the ecology of the auto industry that you know, there are places, master craftsmen who are working in their family shops for 100 years uh, who have never advertised for a client. You know, they're only doing work for, the, for each other, who are doing work for factories, who are making parts that become parts of machines that make um, auto parts between here and Flint. Um, and, so, and this has been a huge um, economic and ecological, really, shift in Detroit, moving from this kind of industry base to the kind of making that we do now. And we wanted to think about all of that making. The artisanal crafts that are going on now with blacksmiths and tie makers and watchmakers. Um, and the people who are still out there making you know, large runs of machinery for industry. Uh, this is, yeah, this is the exhibit um, that was sort of a, a, the first outcome of this project in which we wanted to be faithful not just to the we we researched, we um, interviewed about 50 of these manufacturing places um, from places that were just founded to places that were founded in 1901. Um, and we wanted to be faithful not just to their stories, to their locations, to their processes, but also to the things that they made. So in exhibition, we brought, um, we asked many of these people for objects that they made, for the, the, the um, evidence of their, of their labor and of their processes. Um, in order to just sort of celebrate and, and present to people who don't often get to see these things what's going on there. We also, I am an interaction designer, I, I do the websites, um, and so the, the living part of this project that's still going on today is this website, this Google Maps interface, in which all of these places are mapped to um, their locations in Dearborn, and in Dearborn in this case and in Detroit generally, the Detroit metro area. Um, with, you can see the stories over there on the left, the established date, 1936, five people left, there used to be over 100. Um, and thinking about uh, what's, thinking about this database as something that can change over time, as this, this project has now been handed off to the Detroit Creative Quarter Center and was featured actually in the design, Detroit Design Festival just earlier this fall. Thinking about how people can be added, how stories can be um, added, how stories can be collected about old places, but also thinking about this initial um, interface as a snapshot in time. This is, I chose um, Theory Machine Company Incorporated because Dave Theory uh, was the guy who came in and unlocked the door in the morning, but they, they didn't really do any business, even when we were there. He uh, died this past year. All of, the, um, all of his machinery was auctioned off in this past January, and so this place just isn't there anymore. Meanwhile, new places in Detroit are, are um, coming alive all the time. I think in the process between when we started this project and the exhibition, something like three places closed and four places opened up of the, of the places we were looking at. So part of the problem with being, um, being faithful, being accurate to the past is that the past is a moving target. 
what you're doing is you're always look, looking at a changing process and trying to think, how do I represent that? What part of it is important? Um, this past year, two years later, I've done another research in the city uh, grants, this time with Jen Harmon, who is also in Taubman College. Um, this one's about Chicago. And we wanted to take a look past the usual stories of Chicago, thinking about, as we were in Retoolkit Detroit, thinking about the very local histories, the very particular stories. Um, Chicago has a very famous um, skyline, it has a very famous story of heavy industry, like the, the uh, steel and stockyards and so forth. Um, these are all very well known, and we sort of, there's a, there's a common cliche that pops into your head, and a visual that pops into your head when, when most people think of Chicago. What we wanted to do is look a little bit past that, and think about the hyper-local stories. We, um, Chicago is made of 77 community areas. Uh, we decided to pick seven of them, not the usual seven that get featured, uh, and do individual, seven individual pop-up exhibitions for each of those neighborhoods, addressing each of those neighborhoods as um, the subject of a complete story, and in fact, a complete atlas, as you'll see in a sec. And our choices range from Dunning up in the north, there, um, which is where the uh, county insane asylum was for many years, so that, you know, Chicago parents used to threaten their children, if you don't be good, you'll go to Dunning, meaning the crazy house. Um, all the way down here to the east side and Hegwish, uh, the east side was at one time the, most, the densest industrial corridor in America, that's where the steel industry was, and Hegwish is the working class industrial suburb, um, founded on Marsh, basically right at the corner of Chicago proper. Um, we wanted to think about skylines. I talked about the Chicago skyline. We wanted to think about the individual skylines of those small sections of Chicago. The row houses, the, uh, that's the Pullman factory right there, uh, the trains going by and so forth. Uh, what are these, um, how can we represent these and how can we l bring those stories forward? And how does like, the, the usual stories of heavy industry and, and um, its effect on the landscape, how do those affect the small scale stories of, of regular people and how do those small scale stories reveal something about the larger story that maybe we would have overlooked otherwise. Um, this is again the physical installation which involves a whole lot of mapping, mapping of industry, mapping of the landscape transforming over time in all of these places, mapping of neighborhoods. More interestingly for me, what I spent a lot of my time on was, I shouldn't say that, it's all interesting, but what I spent most of my time on was uh, these pamphlet atlases, one atlas per neighborhood, about 30 pages for each neighborhood, in which we thought a lot about um, the information, the histories of those, of those places and how to represent them and how to tell those stories. This is a timeline, or rather a time graph, of East Side, the industrial corridor. Um, this on the left is the population increase over time, going from this is the, found, the incorporation of Chicago in 1837 to the present day. Um, and these bars over here are duration bars for specific sites or institutions in the neighborhood. Um, color-coded for industries, particular factories. Um, these are commercial st uh, stores. These are churches. Um, this, the cliche about the east side is uh, smokestacks and steeples. There are a lot of factories and a lot of churches. Um, and so you can even hear, you can see uh, the duration bars starts where the factory is founded and ends when it closed. So you can see how industry started in the late 19th century. You can see how the population boomed. You can see also that industry went away right around 1980 and the population collapsed. Um, there's a couple of leftovers there. The last factory closed in 2001. That was the Acme Coke plant. Um, and so stories start to emerge. Uh, thinking again about the neighborhoods, how to represent those on the right is residential in black and industry in yellow in 1937. Here that's overlaid with the territory in 1970. So you can see the vast um, increase of industry and also how residential uh, increased to match. What I also did, though, is drill down and think about individual stories. This is a spread from the Atlas about the Memorial Day Massacre of 1937, which is one of the most famous stories in the history of labor and industry. Um, let's see if I can do this. Yep. Yeah. Okay, up here, that's Union Hall. That's where the Union headquarters were. Hundreds of people, hundreds of striking steel workers met there and then walked down across open prairie um, that's what there was in Chicago at this time, to this area right in front of the Republic Steel Mill, where they were met by Chicago cops and Republic uh, security forces who opened fire on them. Um, over 100 people were injured and 10 people died, uh, striking steel workers. 
Uh, it's not the only violence that, was, that happened in this year, but it was the most famous, um, most famous violence. It's called the Little Steel Strike. Um, now, this is one of those stories, obviously, that we wanted to feature. And the interesting thing for me, researching this story, is that you can find a lot of information about this story. In fact, if you Google Re Republic Steel, this is one of the famous stories that comes up, um, not corporate information. Uh, but while you'll see over and over again that 10 people died in the, in the Memorial Day Massacre, the names of the 10 people who died turn out to be very hard to find. In fact, I couldn't find them online. I eventually transcribed them from a photo that I took of the memorial that's on that site on the east side, on east side, in east side, at east side. So um, this seemed very important to me without like sort of dignifying what I'm trying to do here in terms of bearing witness, it is kind of bearing witness. It's, it's remembering that these people existed, that these people uh, participated in a process that helped to make the world in which I live, and they deserve to be sort of held forth and remembered at least a little bit in terms of who they were and what their names were. At least I do. Um, that was a very powerful moment for me, finding their names. Next step, of course, is to get it out there where other people can see it as well. So those are some projects I've done that involve, um, I'm going to say nonfiction. Fidelity in the sense of being faithful to the histor historical events and presenting them with as little editorial voice as possible. I also do a lot of um, self-directed, self uh, more speculative work. This is a project that I did in, called Not Including the Bridge. Uh, it's showed in New York, and it's site-specific in the sense that what I did was I figured out how long it would take me to walk from my house in Ypsilanti to the place where the exhibition was. This is my house in Ypsilanti. This is the place where the exhibition is. Um, I, I figured out how many hours that would take, and then I wrote one sentence per hour about the imaginary walk that I took. Not that I took it. Um, I think it took some, uh, some hundreds. This, was, this is all vinyl lettering, which was a pain to put up, let me tell you. But um, what, what I'm being faithful to here is not the actual events, because there was no actual event. I made it up. What I'm being faithful to, though, is the territory. I, figured out where each of those hours would take me. I figured out what the landscape would be like. I figured out what the stories were there. Were there any roadside attractions I might stop at and so forth. Um, it's called Not Including the Bridge because it took me these number of hours not including how you get across the bridge into Manhattan. Thinking again about fidelity and speculation, this is a project I, was, I got the chance to do in Grand Rapids um, a few years ago now. Uh, the, um, the museum there, the Natural History Museum, was uh, deaccessioned and abandoned, but a lot years and years ago now. But um, a lot of their materials are still there. All of their exhibitions, materials, um, stuffed birds. In my case, uh, a number of act artists got the uh, chance to go in there and do sp site-specific work in the museum, in these vitrines with the old deaccessioned museum material. So I chose some stuffed birds. Um, I really like taxidermied birds for some reason, and. What I liked about these, though, is that they came in boxes, travel boxes, little travel kits for these birds with um, information about the birds on the side because these were distributed to schools around Michigan in the first half of the 20th century that didn't have teaching materials. They were like, these were sort of um, birds on the go, birds on the road. You would sort of get um, this, uh, you know, a stuffed wren in the mail um, if you were a one-room school teacher. Uh, and you would read the stuff on the side, and you'd have a little unit with your students about, about those birds, and then send the, the um, boxes back to the museum. Um, this, by the way, is an eagle. These are little songbirds here. And so actually, the, the poor little birds, these very dusty, sort of bedraggled little stuffed birds, um, were very, I don't know, picturesque, but what really interested me was the fact that they live in boxes, and the, the, this fact that they're surrounded by stories. So in this installation, um, really what's on display is the boxes, and back here is um, a lot of text about the birds themselves, about rules for taxidermy in order to prep um, birds for study, and about um, pedagogical directives from the state of Michigan in the early, in the early years of the state for how, how one-room schoolhouses should be instructing their, their students. So like all of this huge story around these poor little bird objects. What I'm doing here is I'm trying to investigate the past in a way that I can believe in, so to speak, in a way that's convincing to me. Um, 
I highlight the word convincing not because things aren't real, true, and, true and accurate, but because the way that we convince, but the way that we um, judge whether something is real or true or accurate is whether we're convinced by it. Um, make believe, we think of that as, as meaning it's fictional, it's fake, but what it means is we're making somebody believe it, whether it's just us, in the case of my dad um, tooling around with his gun, or whether it's the case of other people, the public at large, let's say. Um, so how to make things convincing and how to uh, make belief in the past and in the, the landscape of the past turns out to be a very powerful philosophical question. This is Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, he was Chief, Supreme, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he's thinking here really about the law, but this is actually one of my favorite, the last sentence is one of my favorite um, sentences to think about in terms of art. Uh, all the use of life is in specific solutions, um, and those solutions are reached by insight, tact, and specific knowledge. Um, now, if you think that this is the guy who was, if anybody is, um, responsible for determining what law is in the United States, um, thinking, well, he's tactful. You know, that, that turn, that's a, little, a slightly frightening way to think about the law. Um, but the idea is that there are no universal standards out there. The, the law, in his case, consists of what we all tell, our, tell each other the law consists of. In fact, he's on record as, as saying that the law consists of the history of people saying what the law consists of. Um, there's no sort of outside there. It's all a conversation that we're having with each other. And so the nature and understanding that conversation becomes very important. Um, so I do, you know, I do nonfiction and I do fiction, but when I'm doing fiction, I still have that responsibility. Fictionalizing, when I'm looking at a, at a, a historical landscape, it increases my maneuverability. I can you know, collapse time. I can take things from the next town over if I'm telling stories, but it doesn't decrease my responsibility. I'm not completely free to make up whatever I want. Um, I still am responsible in some way to that idea of fidelity. And that, it's a weird balance to draw, but it's a very... It's one that we're all, all drawing all the time. Um, and there's also a difference here between, for me, between investigation, things that I think are good to do, stories that I am um, interested in telling, and research that I personally benefit from, and uh, representation, representing that place to a larger uh, audience. Um, I'm also interested in language, and so thinking about making believe, I'm just gonna show this very, this is a much earlier project when I was interested in um, combinatory language and using language as a divinatory tool to affect the real world. I made a little application called Magicomatic, which creates spells for people. It creates little talismans. Um, and it goes like this. You type in what you'd like. I'd like a pizza. And it creates this little symbol for you. This is a magical symbol based on real 19th century magical uh, texts. Um, that in an ex exhibition, what happened was people could text their wishes on their phones to this num special number, and they, you, you get a spell printed out. Um, you can take the spell home with you and observe the ceremony, burn it, um, and then your wish will come true, theoretically. What also happens is people's spells got added to um, this online database of spells. Uh, this was sort of a hanging garden, so it sort of sways gently in the breeze, so that all of our spells together add up to this, this um, fictional place. Um, as I went along, I got more interested in stories. Uh, this is a, a series that was in uh, the faculty show a few years ago now, in which there was nothing that, well, this was in the faculty show, there was nothing in the gallery except four different versions of me telling the story that, of making the work that wasn't in the gallery. One of those stories was about um, the year I spent um, tattooing everything, every conversation that I overheard all over my body until I was completely covered with tattoos. Um, these kinds of completely speculative, non-existent bodies of work that were unavailable for me to make, but that sort of had this existence in the gallery in this virtual form. Um, I'm gonna skip over here. I think a lot about uh, historical fiction and design as a, as a mode for historical fiction. I've um, created entire characters. Um, this is some uh, book materials about Henry Hayden, who, it, who if he had existed, would have been a British printer in the 1920s who became kind of a cult figure because he uh, tried to make a universal language. Um, but I was really thinking about historical fiction and um, not, that I, not just being faithful to the, to the physical world, but also thinking about a tangible 
connection between me and the story. So it's not just me reading a book, but it's me experiencing the story in physical reality, like the stamp school. Many of you will represent, uh, recognize this. This is the second floor of the gallery. Um, and this is my work in the faculty show last year called Dead Star Maps, in which I created a bunch of constellations, not the usual constellations we see in the heavens, um, punched holes in them in these black pieces of board um, so that as you walk down the hall, the lights in the gallery sort of twinkled at you as though they were actual stars. And in front of each um, constellation was a horoscope, the uh, sort of you know, symbolic meaning of those constellations uh, with dates attached. So you could figure out what your alternate zodiac symbol was and what kind of person you were. Now, the thing about this project that I really enjoyed, um, aside from working at this large scale, which I'd really never done before, and like getting up on the scissor lift and with Mark Nielsen sort of like frantically gaffer taping things to the windows. Um, also, none of these constellations exist now, but they used to. And the stars that they're made of are still up there. They're the actual stars. All the constellations that I used are constellations that were proposed but never caught on or that used to exist in, um, in classical times but have now been forgotten. Uh, so for instance, people were very excited when in the, in the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century and started proposing all of these new uh, uh, constellations based on scientific inventions like the telescope, um, which is one horoscope that I used. Down below we see the reindeer and the harvester, um, which kind of faded away in the 18th century but used to be a thing. Um, and this idea was really attractive to me, the idea not just of using the physical world as something to exhibit stories, but of maintaining that real connection to something that's really out there. Those constellations actually exist. I'm just choosing to interpret them in a certain way. Um, and so I took this, I took this, this um, interest, and I went back to Greensboro, where I taught before I uh, came to Michigan. Greensboro is an interesting town. It has a lot in common with a lot of small towns. Um, more in common with Ypsilanti here than with uh, Ann Arbor in the sense that it's a recently impoverished town that's trying to remake itself as an art center. Um, and, do, and doing a pretty good job. There's some really interesting stuff going on down there. On the left, we see Greensboro in the early 20th century. On the right, we see it now. Um, in the early 20th century, it was fairly prosperous. There was a lot of industry there. Uh, in the, um, now you can see there's a lot of empty storefronts and so forth. Greensboro also has a very interesting history that I was not really a part of as a, as a transient, so to speak, um, middle class college professor. Uh, it has a very tangled history and a very powerful history with the civil rights movement. It was the site of the um, original Woolworth sit-in in, uh, at the beginning of the civil rights era. Before that, it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, but then on the other hand, it was the last meeting place of Jefferson Davis's cabinet at the end of the Civil War before they all fled. Um, it also was the site much ma many years later in about 1980 of a KKK murder, um, a KKK rally and murder, I should say. Um, so a very uh, interesting and tangled relationship with history that um, was powerful to me, but that I wasn't sure how to deal with. And I dealt with it in a couple of ways. I've done a couple of projects in Greensboro now, public art in both cases. Um, the first is called What You Missed. This was part of a public art festival in which what I wanted to do was um, have a bunch of street signs around, again, thinking about the historical uh, marker idea of some event that the passerby just happens not to see. Like it might have happened um, just now, or it might have happened 100 years ago. Each of these are based on um, secret societies. When I was doing research into early Greensboro of 100 years ago, there's all this really fascinating stuff about secret societies, like the Brotherhood of Elks, secret. The Brotherhood of Elks, uh, Masons, um, all these benevolent protection societies, which again, um, many of them are middle class party groups, but then are tangled in with uh, working class uh, mutual aid societies. This is where a lot of working and middle class people first had insurance is by uh, participating in these secret societies. Also, you know, both the KKK and the, under, and the descendants of the Underground Railroad and Jim Crow, these sort of uh, heavily politicized secret societies are also part of this story. Um, so I, I fictionalized a number of the, the um, secret societies or told fictional stories about them uh, that were active in Greensboro at this time and about 100 years ago and um, told stories based on them. And in order to do that, I, I created not just the stories themselves or the moments themselves, like you can see up at the top, 
Um, those are, that's a sign that got posted near the railway station. I also um, investigated a lot about these secret societies and um, where I couldn't find information. I, I um, create a lot of backstory for my own secret societies, a sort of practice for thinking about this kind of history. Um, the Six Point Crown is one based on the Brotherhood of Elks. The League of Carpenters is based on the Masons. Um, so this was, as I say, it was a public art festival. Um, those signs went up for a weekend and then they came down, mostly. But some of those signs um, are still there over a year later. Um, and that's, that's kind of great. Uh, it's really great. Um, there, there are two ways in which this kind of public art can be flattering. One is here, where this, this sign, or half of this sign, is still up over a year later, because um, people just like it being there. The other is with the um, Secret True Adventures, the story about my dad. Um, I kept putting those signs up, and they kept getting stolen. Like, I lost about six out of ten of them over the course of the, uh, the festival. And I was like, I, I'm, I'm glad people like them, frankly. Um, Okay, so this was my first entry into public art in Greensboro. I kept thinking about the history, though, and I kept thinking about this particular history of uh, Greensboro and the Jim Crow South, which, you know, Greensboro is a college town, obviously, since I was teaching there. Um, it's in North Carolina, which is not quite the deep south, it's sort of the shallow south. So it's possible to live in Greensboro and not feel a lot of the, the more famous elements of um, racism. And this was interesting to me because I grew up in the Northeast, which is, certainly has a lot of racism, but unremarked racism, non-incidental racism. So like, there were black people living right down the street from me, across, um, not across the tracks, but across a block divide. My little five, um, five block street went white people, white people, black people, black people, black people. And there was no um, crossing back and forth, which I didn't really think about until years later. But I think about it now. And I think about um, that, and I'm doing work now about my own, uh, hometown, actually, but uh, in terms of Greensboro, I think about this history, becoming aware of this history, for myself at least, um, and thinking about how and whether it's appropriate for me to tell stories about it. This is a, pro a storefront project called Long Forgotten Blues, in which I went back down and I found a bunch of uh, objects that dated from around 100 years ago again. And I used these objects in two different ways. This uh, storefront, you can see it wraps around. Um, so I made these pedestals that tell the story of these objects um, in two different ways. There's a different story depending on what side of the window you're on. So the other side of these pedestals have a different story. Um, and the story is, takes place, both of those stories take place at this site, which used to be a lumber store um, 100 years ago. Um, and it's about, uh, this was a show that was reacting to the blues. And it's, the character here um, is a person who works in the store who happens to be a really good blues clarinet player but never really goes anywhere because there are no outlets for him. There's, he, he never gets a shot as a musician. And on the other, in the other story, he does get a shot as a musician. It's the, it's the stories that might have happened to him. Um, he's based actually on a uh, uh, New Orleans clarinetist, a really great blues clarinetist named George Lewis, who worked as a dock worker until he was in his 40s. Um, he wasn't discovered and didn't really get a chance to travel and, and tour until that point. And what I was thinking about here is what if that didn't happen? Greensboro is a small town in the middle of nowhere. What if he just nipped with that, that never happened? He just continued to live in the Jim Clover South the rest of his life. Um, with some explanatory materials as though this were a, hist a history museum. And uh, at the bottom of the pedestals, these are um, perform blues performances sh uh, shining through the stenciled text of blues lyrics so that at night, um, you know, the store is abandoned. At night, all you can see are these blues lyrics sort of flickering at you as you, as you walk down the street. Um, now, this was an interesting for me in terms of uh, telling this story, learning about the story. I'm very glad that I did all this research. I learned a lot of interesting and disturbing and powerful stuff. And thinking about my relationship to that history and my, my responsibility to it. Now, there's other, another question, which is, what does it mean for me as a northern white guy to go down to a southern town, even one where I used to live, down the street from the Civil Rights Museum and tell a story about the Jim Crow South? Um, I felt terrible, actually. I felt, I felt like I, I was inserting myself into a place in which I had no business. And there's, there's a distinction here, and I, I debated about whether to go into this um, in this talk, but apparently I am. Uh, there's a distinction between the subject matter and, you know, any artist or any writer has the ability to, to address any subject matter that they want as long as they do it responsibly and thoroughly um, and in, intelligently. Um, and the context, which is me as an artist 
uh, coming into this space and doing work rather than, let's say, a black artist doing the same thing. Um, those are two separate but related phenomena. And while I think the first, me having done this research and investigating these stories was a very positive experience, at least for me personally, and some other people liked it as well, I think that I chose not to push this work, I mean, I put a lot of work into this, but I chose not to push this work any further because it seemed irresponsible. It seemed out of place. I didn't have enough connection to this place to uh, justify the site specificity in that way. And that's a big challenge with site-specific work. Um, so often, you sort of fly into a site, you do site-specific site work there for you know, a few days, and then you fly back out. Um, really making site-specific work, I am increasingly convinced, means uh, living there for a long time, um, whether in your head or hopefully physically. Um, I have one more project to talk about, but I am out of time. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, think very quickly about getting lost. Uh, thinking about place is something that I do in part because to say that I have a bad sense of direction would be to imply that I have a sense of direction at all. Um, Smartphones have changed my life quite a lot because uh, I no longer, I mean, I used to literally, when I went to a conference, for instance, I would go a day early so that I could spend a day getting lost everywhere before I had to be somewhere. Um, now I've got GPS on my smartphone, which is much more convenient, but of course, kind of less fun. Um, this quote from Walter Benjamin has always been one of my favorites, uh, that not finding your way is easy and annoying, um, but really getting lost, really getting lost in a territory is a skill that takes a lifetime to learn. And it's a skill that takes a lifetime to learn about a particular place. Um, you have to be so used to a place that when you suddenly take a left turn that you weren't expecting, suddenly you become uh, aware of it again. Suddenly you, um, your, your brain becomes present in that place in a way that you'd forgotten was possible. And that's where real knowledge really um, arises from. Not the introductory research, but the research that suddenly happens after you thought that you knew a place. Suddenly getting lost again. And that's a lot of what I'm trying to do with my work for myself and for hopefully the people who look at it. Um, encouraging that idea of productively getting lost. Um, moving past knowledge until you forget it and are re re um, challenged by something else. I'm going to show one thing. I'm going to, the stuff that I'm showing you is super interesting, but I'm going to move again, move forward to um, a project that I did in um, Dubai, of all places, but about Dearborn. This is the project that I was very enthusiastic about with my collaborator. It's a video installation project about these objects. These objects are from the Model T toolkit um, from, again, about 100, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in 100 years ago. Um, when you bought a Model T, you, it came with a toolkit so that you could fix the car yourself. Um, and what I thought was interesting about this is that these tools uh, are giving you a kind of agency. You're the mechanic. You can fix your own car as long as it's a Model T. So it's, it's a kind of scripted agency. You, you get to do what the, the corporation wants you to do. And that's particularly in the case, true in the case of this, which is a hubcap wrench. Um, you know, this is an adjustable wrench, tire iron, those are sort of generic tools, but the hubcap wrench only works on a Model T. Uh, it's an early case of a mass-produced proprietary tool. Um, and so the idea of um, the tool as this kind of individual agency, I have the story in this tool, but um, I don't get to do that all that much with it, was interesting. And it seemed like an interesting symbol for uh, how this object um, can tell us something about the history of industry in this place and the transformation of Dearborn over time. So what we did was we created a four-part um, interactive video installation. Uh, these are all, you can sort of see the mini projector up here. These are all projections shooting downward onto horizontal uh, projection surfaces, which I, I actually brought stretcher bars and projection cloth with me to Dubai, and we built these in that space, which was, again, a pain. Um, when you first walk up to one of these, you see a blueprint paper, uh, blank. When you put one of these objects on it, the blueprint paper tells you about the quote design, the narrative of that object um, in the form of um, fragments of text that are all taken from first person stories about the history of um, Dearborn from um, 1830s through uh, the current day. 
and also video of the places as they are now in um, Dearborn. We went and took a lot of close-up um, video and photography of those sites. And in that juxtaposition, we're hoping that the, the surrealism of the, the modern landscape of all of these moments and all of these objects and stories bumping up against each other becomes revealing in a way. Um, it reveals something about history. It, 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 it forces this history to become alive and meaningful in a way that it might not have done before. So this is where we're at right now. This just happened about a month ago. Um, and going forward now, Pop-Up Chicago as the nonfiction project and this as the more speculative or poetic project are what I'm working on for the next few years. Um, Pop-Up Chicago has a grant in the works that we have, uh, um, I have a good feeling about it. Um, we're gonna bring that back to Chicago. We're gonna exhibit there. I feel like now having done all that work, we finally, we're at the point where I can actually go into the neighborhoods that we were studying and have an intelligent conversation with people who live there about what actually happened there. Um, so we've sort of done our due diligence to actually do the job now. And here as well, um, this is going to move forward into a larger immersive narrative environments. We're also um, going to increase the number of objects that we're cataloging and the number of stories and, and speculations really about the past that can be contained in a physical form of objects. Um, you know what, those of you who have had me in class know that I, I tend to say, um, this is a tangent, but I think it's interesting. I'm gonna end on a tangent that I think is interesting. You know what this reminds me of? Um, the band Sonic Youth, uh, one of my favorites from my youth. Um, they experimented a lot with uh, alternate tunings and altered instruments. They made their own instruments, so that by the time, by about 1993 or so, they had this enormous library of sounds in physical form actual instruments that could only be played one way. Or, or if you wanted that one particular sound, you would go get that one uh, guitar that had a short neck and three strings on it. Um, so they're like doing the sonic research, but not digitally, physically. The, it was a f enormous, I mean, they toured with this huge bus full of nothing but gear. Um, an enormous physicalized library of sound. And that's what I'm interested in here, a physicalized library of story. Um, objects that contain and reveal stories, both imaginative and hopefully loyal to the territory that they come from. Um, I think I'll stop there. Thanks, everybody.